Fifty years ago in the little city of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, in the local ice rink, the training camp of the Detroit Red Wings, I met Bud Lynch, and there began a lifelong friendship. When I first moved from the Sioux to a radio station in Pontiac, a young and a very nervous and somewhat frightened young announcer, trying very hard to prove himself, into the station walked Bud, absolutely unannounced, bringing along Jack Adams, one of the area's most prestigious sports figures, to say hello. Well, I'll tell you, it impressed my small station management, and it made me feel accepted. And when the Stroh Brewery back in 1964 asked me to be a part of the broadcast team, Bud, as I love to say, opened his arm and welcomed me in. And through all the years of working together, we have never had anything but a wonderful time with one another. Guess he's been there as long as a franchise and still going strong as a voice of the public address system. A great person and a great friend, Bud Lynch. Bud, you know, you've worked for the Red Wings for thousand years, maybe 1,500, and uh, uh, Jerry and I have known you for 50 years, but you know, the, the thing that really gets me, everybody knows you've lost your right arm. Now, to me, what I can't get is the good cheer that you've had all of these years. I've never once heard you complain about it, and all I've ever heard you do is make light of it. How do you do that thing? Well, I suppose when you're an Irishman, somewhat blessed that my number didn't come up at the right time. I've always felt in the service days, uh, having been a volunteer out of Windsor to join an Essex Scottish unit and being an Irishman and then going overseas to represent proudly the Essex Scottish in Canada and then forgetting to duck that one day in France. Um, commando trained, I always felt if I could walk and talk I'd live, I guess. That was one of my theories and beliefs. And I guess uh, the good Lord said, You're, we don't want you yet. All right, you know, f almost a half a century with the Red Wings. And the man uh, that we're all so fascinated with all these years later is Jack Adams. Uh, rough, tough, uh, I, I always consider him a Santa Claus. He looked like Santa Claus. He could be harsh, but he could be very, very gentle. Uh, give us a couple of Jack Adams stories. Jack Adams was an amazing man to look at him. You say frustrated. At times he was uh, flushed, red in the face. And everybody assumed that he was hitting the, bo the bottle with him. Jack never drank a day in his life. His father was an alcoholic in the railroad away up in Port Arthur, Fort William, but Jack never touched it. But Jack loved to go to parties, loved to go to the bar. On the road, uh, Roy Bash from the Times, photographer, Scotty Kilpatrick, and the Walter Boys, the writers, the broadcasters. We were always taken to different places in every city. Jack knew everybody. New York, we were at the Piccadilly, of course, most of the time. We go to the Roosevelt. Lombardo played there. As soon as Jack Adams came in with the media corps after beating the Rangers or something, Carmen or Guy or Liebert would stop and they start playing Pretty Red Wing. Here comes Jack Adams. He was, he was that important. Tell us about Jack's, quote, temper, unquote. Jack uh, <laughs> would uh, blow his stack quite, he was a very devout Catholic, but he would blow his stack unmercifully. Take it out on the players in the dressing room, throw things around, and uh, not being in the dressing room to see it, but we heard it from the players, from Lefty. Left, lefty would cut the oranges up and then duck, because when Adams came in after a bad first period, it was target practice, ducking. Um, Jack had a habit uh, in his coaching days. Uh, he wanted every player to play it his way. And, uh, of course, we had chicken wire, and the referee could hear his voice pretty well. And uh, the opposing players could hear it, too. And Jack would get on their back pretty fast. And Jack had a habit after a game. Um, he took Helen, his wife, and they would drive for hours. He just had to unwind. I know he wasn't beloved. You said he had warmness of heart. Yet I've spoken to players, uh, Carl Liscom for one, and this is more than 50 years later, who, who denounce him for being a terrible tyrant for being cheap, tough in contract negotiations. I think Ted Lindsay felt the same way. What do you remember that aspect of? I'll give you an example. I think that I used it several times many years ago. Norm Ullman had a pretty good year one year and went back to summer camp, back to the West. When he came back to training camp that year, uh, he went in to see Jack Adams and on the back of an envelope, the lip of the envelope, and he said he and his wife Bibbs had 
talked it over. If I get uh, eight more goals this year, can I get $1,500 bonus? Jack said, by all means. There were seven different things on that little fly leaf on the envelope that he ticked off. If I get more assists, if we win first place, we go to the finals. $1,500 bonus. $1, oh, Jack says, by all means, son. He called everybody son. By all means, son. Christmas, Normie Ullman is stinking the joint up. He calls Bibbs into his office, his wife, and says, Bibbs, that boy's got to perform. He's going to blow $7,400 this year. Had his best year the rest of the year. <laughs> so Jack was a conniver in many, many ways. Uh, I think, truthfully, that Jack had control, and I think that was important. He was respected and disliked around the league as well. I'll say one word to you, Gordy. Gordy was a humble, bashful, um, as you'll admit, limited education. And as a result, he picked up something along the way all the time. He and Marcel Pronable did things I thought amazed me at the time, but you found out later. They loved to work crossword puzzles. Marcel, French, limited English, would sit in the back of the bus or in the lobby of a hotel, and they work a crossword puzzle, and Gordy would get the French words from Marcel, and Marcel would get English words from Gordy. But they were almost self-educated himself to keep themselves occupied, too. Ted. Ted, Lindsay, Robert, Blake, Theodore, and then they throw the word in, terrible Ted. Ted was just a great competitor. So when Ted came into the Red Wing organization, limited in size, but don't forget his daddy had been a hockey player way back, a goalkeeper. And uh, as a result, he knew the sport, loved it. And uh, his feistiness and he loved com competition. He loved to be challenged. And he was challenged. That's the way he played the game. You know, one of the most mysterious figures in, in all those years, the last half century, was Terry Sawchuck. Well, Terry, they call him the Yuke. He came from uh, the Winnipeg area where there were a lot of Ukrainians and Slavic people. And Terry was obviously a, a loner in many, many ways. Uh, he... Uh, could play the game, pretty good baseball player too. He had a shriveled arm. A lot of people didn't realize he, the elbow really went cockeyed at times. And um, his amazing career, all those shutouts and the Stanley Cup win when he shut out Toronto twice and Montreal twice when the octopus was thrown on the ice that one year at Olympia. Terry Sawchuk was the guttiest of all the goalkeepers in my coverage. And I saw some great ones. And um, Terry had a a habit in Montreal particularly, he knew I'd come down from the broadcasting booth a little bit late. He would call me over as soon as I get in the visitor's locker room. He'd wave to me. I knew what it meant. He wanted me to sit with him like I'm interviewing him so none of the writers from Montreal could talk to him. <laughs> oh, he double-crossed the boys in New York a couple of times the same way. And I, we'd be sitting, we wouldn't be talking about anything, but I was sitting with him and the writers wouldn't dare come over. You once gave me a great story about Sid Abel. Could you recall it for us? Sid got into a habit that one year that uh, after a game, if they won a tough game, uh, no way would he go into a bar if the players were there, and no way could the players come into a bar if he was there. In New York, he beats the Rangers 4-1 to one this one night. By the time I come down to the dressing, to the dressing room, Boot is on cloud nine. He says, oh, bud, we're going to have a couple of pops. The first block from the garden, we're going to stop and have a good one before we go back to the hotel. The players knew the story. Eight bars from Matt Old Garden to the uh, Oyster Bar. Eight bars, there was one player in every bar. Waving to us as we walked by and Sid's tongue getting longer and I'm getting thirsty and my pipes are drying out. And Sid said, I'll fix those guys. <laughs> <laughs>